Today we're going to continue discussing uh, consumer motivation and affect. This is part two of two. So the first thing we're going to discuss, we were talking about how motivation essentially is answering the question of why consumers uh, buy what they buy and use what they use, right? Um, and affect, uh, it's an important aspect that answers some of that why, right? Because we do feel certain emotions that naturally or spontaneously arise when we think or see or use certain products, right? And now there is another uh, important consideration, which is that uh, our motivational aspects and affect are going to change dramatically depending on the level of involvement that we have at the time. Now, involvement is an interesting construct Right? It's something that psychology uses for many different aspects. It seems to be a very important thing that basically determines what's going to happen with the, some of the different processes within, within our brain. Right? And not only involvement is going to be important, it's also going to be a function of the situation. Right? So maybe some contextual factors and the product itself and the actual message that marketers are crafting. So we'll talk about some of this in a minute. So first, let's start discussing what involvement actually is. Uh, involvement is essentially what consumers think uh, it's important about the object. And by the way, when I say object, I'm usually referring to the product or service, but it could also be the message, okay? As we're gonna see uh, later, uh, involvement is something that you can measure and you have both for products and also ads and messages. Now, in a way, what's going to happen is the kind of processes that are going to be triggered in your mind are going to be a function of how important something is for you. For example, if you go to the grocery store, right, and you usually buy certain products. So let's say that, for example, when it comes down to ketchup, I always buy Heinz ketchup, right? And I always buy, uh, I don't know, 16 ounce bottle, right? And... So when I get to the store and I'm walking down the aisle where the ketchup is on my right, right, and I'm pushing my cart, without having to think much about it, I just grab the ketchup that I usually purchase and put it in the cart. This is a situation where I'm essentially using inertia to make my decision, right? This is what I usually do. This is a product category that in my case has low involvement, Right, because I don't know, because I've always bought the same thing and I really not a ketchup connoisseur, whatever that means, right? So because of that, what I end up doing is I keep doing what I've been doing in the past. And that's what inertia essentially is. Right. And that showcases that um the kind of processes we're gonna follow when it comes down to making decisions might actually be a function of how involved we are in the product category, right? On the other hand, uh, if my situation changes, right, and I don't know, I'm going to have some friends over and we're going to be tasting, uh, I don't know, uh, different hamburger and fry uh, combinations from uh, different restaurants. Maybe I want to buy different types of ketchup bottles because, yeah, I don't know, I'm trying to provide a more uh, interesting experience for my uh guests. So in a situation like that, uh, my product involvement now suddenly goes up. Now suddenly I care about ketchup, whereas usually I don't. And because of that, I might actually go to the aisle, start looking at the different brands that are in the aisle, start thinking about maybe what other uh, uh, products I can use other than ketchup uh, to go with fries so that I can actually provide a more interesting experience for my guests, right? So as involvement changes, the processes that undergo, that consumers undergo to make decisions will actually be different, okay? Uh, the extreme opposite of that, uh, when somebody's really, really involved with a product category, that's when you find uh, situations like cult products, right? These are products where people are extremely loyal to um, and you see, uh, behavior that uh, borders the irrational, right? For example, consumers tattooing 
uh, a logo of a brand into their bodies, right? Something that is fairly permanent and very difficult to remove, right? So cold products are usually products uh, where consumers are highly involved with the product category. Otherwise, they do not turn into that degree of loyalty uh, associated with the products. So involvement is an important variable that is gonna determine what kind of behaviors do you actually see in the marketplace. Now, involvement is a very important construct. It's a very important uh, aspect that has been studied extensively in the literature by many people, both in psychology and consumer behavior. Uh, and the reason why is because it seems to uh, determine a lot of the processes that we actually observe in consumers, right? So here I'm going to walk you through a few of the factors that determine your level of involvement, right? So you have involvement here uh, in the middle, okay? And we're going to have three different types of involvement. It's going to be involvement with the message, right? With the product, which is, I would say, probably the strongest of all of them, but not nonetheless. And then also involvement with the purchase decisions, okay? Actually, all of them can be important. It depends on the situation, right? Um, but we can distinguish between each of them. So they are different they have different goals or objects but it's involvement nonetheless how important it is for us essentially okay and this is going to be driven to what extent you know the advertising is important for us or the product's important for us or the purchase decision is important for us it's going to be a function of other factors uh, the first set of factors is going to be personal factors right and this deals with for example, uh, what kind of needs do you have at that point, right? So, for example, if your stomach's growling, suddenly the importance of a product like food, right, is going to just skyrocket. And the reason why is because in your particular situation uh, and for you, now uh, hunger is something that is triggering uh, the importance or the involvement that you actually will show a high level of involvement with uh, food, right? Yeah. Uh, also, it might be the case that because of your interest, right, there are certain product categories, for example, that are interesting or important to you, right? Uh, in my case, for example, I like watches, right? Why? I don't know. I just do. I started uh, being interested in watches when I was a kid. I would just stop at, you know, jewelry stores and look at watches and, I guess, uh, daydream about buying some of them when I was a little, I mean, 10 years old and I had no money, right? Um, and now I have a small watch collection, right? So I have a high level of involvement with this product category. Why? Because of personal interest. And uh, so this is an importance that I'm giving it, you know, out of my uh, values and what uh, it's curious to me, right? And these are going to vary from person to person, right? Good. What else? Then there is also uh, aspects of the object or maybe more importantly of the message that might be relevant and they might change the degree of involvement with either the message or the product, okay? Or the purchase situation like we've seen, okay? So for example, uh, the source of the communication might actually matter. What do I mean by that? Well, when I see an advertising, I know that the company is the one that is creating that ad. So the source of that message is one that I'm a little bit suspect about. Why? Because of course the firm has an incentive to tell me that something is great, regardless of whether it's great or not, because guess what? Because they're trying to sell the product, right? On the other hand, if a friend of mine, right, is telling me how, how great the experience was with a particular service, let's say that he went to get a haircut into a local place and he's telling me how great it was in whatever ways it was great, right? Because I know that he's my friend and that he's not uh, financially invested into telling me this, then guess what? my level of involvement and how much attention I'm going to pay to that message is going to be very different than in the case of an ad that comes from the company. And I know because of that, that, you know, they are likely to, let's just say, overhype the product a little bit, or maybe a lot. It depends, right? Good. And finally, you're going to have also situational factors that are going to determine the degree of involvement that you're going to showcase. And when I say you, I mean any consumer. 
right? For example, the actual use uh, my my change dramatically how involved you are with the product category, right? So if I'm trying to get a quick meal because I'm hungry and I'm driving, I don't know, uh, around town, uh, the go I'm gonna the way I'm gonna be involved with that purchase situation might actually be a low involvement thing for me, right? I'm worried about something else that I'm trying to accomplish. Maybe I'm running some errands, right? Something that my wife wants and I'm trying to get done so that she's happy with me. And guess what? You know, I see, you know, on my right side, there's an exit and it's an I-64 where I can see a McDonald's right there. I can see the Golden Arches. So what do I do? I just, you know, pull over, get out of the interstate and grab, grab some food. On the other hand, right, um, if I'm trying to uh, organize a, a business dinner, right, because I'm trying to, I don't know, hire somebody, right, they go, the way I'm going to go about selecting the restaurant is going to be very different. And the reason why it's going to be different is twofold. One is the goal is different. Everybody understands that, right? But two, the level of involvement that I have is a lot higher, right? Because the decision to hire somebody is a lot more risky for me. And because of that, I'm going to put a lot of care, probably, into thinking about the restaurant in this case, right? That's the decision I'm trying to make, right? So the purchase situation changes the stakes dramatically, right? My level of involvement within that uh, decision is going to change, right? And here you can see on the right side some of the outcomes from involvement. Okay, good. Now, how do you measure involvement? Um, involvement is in your mind, right? It's something that only you know as a consumer, right? So uh, what psychometricians do is we try to create, and I say we because I've done quite a, a few things in psychometrics, right? Um, what we try to do is we try to understand uh, what the individual is thinking. Right. And to do that, oftentimes, although it's not the only way to measure things, um, we ask you. Right Now, the difficult thing is coming up with the right question. Right? The question that is going to enable us to measure this maybe somewhat elusive concept of involvement. Right? And here you can see scale. Scale is a set of questions that are trying to measure the same thing. The reason why we measure the same thing multiple ways is because there is measurement error and we're trying to account for that. Okay, also because maybe the construct or the concept we're trying to measure has different facets to it. Okay, so here you can see that we have 10 questions, right? So we will ask somebody to complete this short questionnaire, right? 10 questions. And the way we are going to score it in this particular case is using what is known as a semantic differential. What is a semantic differential? It's a scale or a question where at the two ends of it, you have two polar opposite adjectives, right? Important, unimportant. Boring, interesting, right? And then what you ask people to do is tell you where they stand within this continuum, right? So it's very unimportant for me. It's fairly boring, right? Or eh, it's not that relevant, right? Boom, boom, boom. And so you can see. Now notice that the way this is built, uh, you're trying to, to some degree, created in a way that uh, answering always on the same side of the scale is not the right answer because otherwise what people do is they stop paying attention they don't read and they just keep answering on the right anyway that's beyond the scope of this class so this is one of the different ways in which you can measure involvement so the way you will do this is you will give it a certain numeric value so you can put here a one and here seven or whatever the number of squares you have and then at the end of the day uh, you will basically use some sort of either average or summation of all the scores now when you do that you'll have to be careful uh, that he, uh, between these two scales uh, if you scale, scale something high here is equivalent to something low here right because they are polar opposites right you have important and important so unimportant is here uh, but you have boring and interesting. So if you score over here, that will mean that it's interesting. So you have high level of involvement. Anyway, long story short, what you do is you end up uh, changing the scale so that when you add them all up, you get something that is measuring the degree to which that particular individual is interested in that particular purchase or product category or ad.
Now, what are the different types of involvement? I already mentioned this. We're going to discuss three different types of uh, involvement. Involvement with regards to the product, right? So how much do you care about motorcycles, right? Or, um, I don't know, uh, undergrad degrees, right? Um, you could also have involvement, and you do have involvement, degree of involvement with the message, right? So when you're watching TV or you are looking at your phone and there is a commercial that pop ups, pops up, maybe you're watching a YouTube video and there is an ad, right? And how involved are you with that particular message, that particular ad? And that will maybe depend, depends on how much. You hate commercials, right? Some people don't like them because they interrupt whatever they were doing. So maybe you install ad blocker in your computer so that you don't have to actually watch the commercials in your YouTube video, right? And on the other hand, some people like me might actually care about the message a lot, right? So for example, when I was at a different institution and I was teaching PhD students, uh, many of them uh, were international students. So what I will do, like me, I guess, and uh, what I will do is I will have them come. Uh, they were a small group, right? They were, let's say, five to ten students. Uh, I will invite them to my home uh, during Super Bowl, and we will, you know, do a potluck or something. And the idea behind it was a to get them acquainted with football because maybe. They don't know much about football, especially if they're international students, but also be to watch the commercials during the Super Bowl, right? Being a marketing professor and they were marketing PhD students, right? I'm interested in what companies are doing when it comes down to messaging. So in my case, the degree of involvement with messaging is really high just because of my profession. But that might also depend on other things like your needs, right? If you're looking for a good place for vacation, then maybe you'll pay attention to messages that deal with I don't know, trips that you can take to the Caribbean, whereas in a regular uh, situation, maybe not so much, right? And then you have situational involvement, which is uh, the contextual factors that make you be more interested in a particular situation, right? And I think I've already alluded to some of these, right? Um, for example, dry cleaners. I don't care about dry cleaners, to be honest with you. I barely use them. However, if I have a job interview, Right, and I want to look the best that I can, whatever that means, right? And then maybe I will take my suit to the dry cleaner, right? Why? Because I know they're going to clean it and they're going to iron it in a way that if I try to do at home, it's not going to work, or at least not nearly as well. So because of my situational involvement, just because I'm worried about my job interview, guess what? Now suddenly I care about dry cleaners, right? And so involvement is a very powerful uh, variable that is going to make you shift dramatically uh, in the kind of processes that you're going to engage before making decisions depending on your degree of involvement. Okay, good. Now, let's talk about a little bit more in detail about product involvement, which I will say is probably of the three the most straightforward. Okay. Uh, what determines the product involvement uh, that you show or the consumers have? Uh, the number one factor I would say is perceived risk. How risky is it to make a purchase or use a particular product in that product category? Okay. So for example, um, I don't know, buying a home, right? Buying a home. That's something that most people only do a few times in their life. Okay. And because of that, the perceived risk is pretty high, right? Why? Because if you don't like it, you're not gonna just buy another home next month. That's not how it usually works, right? So suddenly perceived risk is high, right? Also there is financial risk associated with it, right? So usually uh, buying a home is the highest uh, dollar uh, purchase that you're gonna do uh, for most of us. I mean, unless you're buying a private jet or uh, I don't know, an expensive yacht, uh, or you're buying a firm, I don't know, right? But most of us, um, the most expensive item we're gonna purchase is a home, okay? And in a situation like that, the risk perception increases dramatically, right? Because if I'm gonna spend lots of money into something, I better get it right, okay? 
Another thing that tends to increase the degree of involvement with a product is how customized that product is. Okay, what do I mean by this? Well, if it was made explicitly for me, right? So for example, if I go to a tailor and I have them uh, make uh, a suit just for me, right? They take measurements and then they, they cut the fabric and they so it, and everything is basically made explicitly for me. The degree of involvement that I'm going to feel with that product is going to increase dramatically. Right? And one trend that you see in the marketplace is this idea of mass customization, right? Where because of the technologies that we have available right now, uh, you can customize to some degree some of the products, right? So you can see this in the case of Coke, right? Where you can write a message in the can. Or the same thing done by M&Ms, right? Where in each of the M&Ms, you can say, eh, I don't know, love you, eh, put a little heart, and then the name of your girlfriend, right? <laughs> now, suddenly, eh, this little customization option, eh, it makes you a lot more eh, involved with that particular product. Maybe you don't care that much about M&Ms, but it might be actually a great gift for your girlfriend or significant other, whatever that means, right? Um... Another thing that changes product involvement is brand loyalty. If you're a dive hair fan for a brand, like maybe, I don't know, you swear by Apple products, right? In a situation like that, that's going to increase the level of involvement with products associated with the brand. So if Apple suddenly now decides to build a car, even though you're not a car person because you are a brand loyal Apple fan, now suddenly you might start becoming involved uh, into cars. Now suddenly you care about cars, whereas you didn't before. Right? And then finally, we're going to talk about the concept that it kind of plays the polar opposite effect of product involvement, which is variety seeking. Now, variety seeking is something that is showcased by consumers in some product categories and some consumers, not everybody does it. But it's the idea that even if you are satisfied with a certain product, you buy a different product because you enjoy trying new things. Okay. And so in a situation like this, it's almost kind of like the opposite of product involvement in the sense that uh, instead of sticking to what you like, um, what you end up doing is just the opposite, right? It's like you like to try new brands of yogurt even though you know you like Danone already, okay? So variety seeking is this interesting phenomenon. People derive hedonic pleasure just from trying new things even if it's risky, right? It's something that they don't know if they're going to like or not. Okay. Now, we already talked about perceived risks, but here we have a little bit more of a breakdown. I think I've already alluded to a couple of these. One is monetary risk or financial risk, right? And that is very simple, right? It's the amount of money you spend, at least relative to your income, right? So if your income is really high, uh, maybe spending $1,000 is not a big deal, right? But if your income is low, uh, $1,000 might pose a serious uh, monetary risk for you. And because of that, your degree of involvement will increase as the amount of money that you spend in a product or service goes up, right? No, no surprises here. Okay. Next one is functional risk, okay? What happens if things go wrong with the product, if it doesn't fulfill the performance that it was expected? to uh, fulfill. Um, and of course, that can vary dramatically, right? So for example, if you're making a purchase within a firm, right? Uh, if it doesn't actually work, right? So for example, if you hire somebody, uh, a consultant, right? And uh, if it doesn't actually work, you might get fired, right? So in a situation like that, where, you know, the functional uh, risk will be associated with whether the product it's it's delivering on its promises or not, that might be a function of uh, what kind of function that product or service is going to fulfill for you, right? If it's something minor like gum, no big deal, right? Low functional risk. On the other hand, if you are having heart surgery, functional risk may be really, really high. So you want to pick the best surgeon you can find, right? No surprises there. Physical risk, I guess the example, previous example that I provided, it also helps here, right? Physical risk is, you know, things that could actually go wrong uh, to your body or those that you care for, right? So physical risk, uh, 
something that actually will determine, for example, the kind of car you buy, right? Maybe you look at safety ratings because, you know, one of the most likely way in which you're going to get hurt or seriously injured is by having a crash in a car, right? So if you know this, uh, you know that the physical risk of purchasing a car is actually reasonably high. So because of that, you might actually do some research when it comes down to this, okay? Then there is social risk, right? This is the idea that others within groups that you belong to or you want to belong to um, might reject to you because of the purchases that you make or the products that you use. For example, certain songs or admitting that you listen to certain songs like, I don't know, Justin Bieber, if you're a gentleman, right? Um, might be, be frowned upon into certain circles, right? And because of that, and there is social risk associated with purchasing or listening to particular songs. And of course, that depends on the group and the individual. Okay. So there is social risk. And same thing happens with the way you dress and the way you act when you are with certain people, etc. And then finally, you have psychological risk, which is the risk that uh, essentially you will be unhappy with a purchase or you'll have some psychological bother associated with the purchase. For example, the idea of feeling guilty when you eat something that you know you're not supposed to eat, right? So there is a psychological risk associated with it, other than maybe physical risk too, if you have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, right? And same thing can happen with buying a luxury product, right? You may feel guilty about expending so much money. That is a psychological risk and that will increase the degree of uncertainty and because of that, it will increase the involvement that you have within that particular decision or product category. Good. Now, we've talked about um, involvement with the product and we've gone in detail about some of the factors that determine that. And then there is involvement with the message itself, right? And by message, I'm talking about commercials, I'm talking about stories that brands tell you, right? And I want to emphasize that if you do a good job with the message, people can get really involved into it. And they can actually care about what you're telling them. Right? And that is a good precursor to have them get involved with the brand. Okay? And you can see some companies have done a particularly good job with this, right? where they have created maybe uh, games associated with some of their messaging where they involve people uh, that are either potential customers or actual customers. And because of this, uh, people will listen and pay attention to what you have to say a lot more because they will have a high degree of involvement, right? And um, you can see this within video games, for example. And also there are alternative reality games. You can read about that um, in the book. But within video games, you can see some of this, right? So if you're an avid video game player, which you may or may not be, and if you are, by the way, your average age is about, what is it now, 37 or something like that. So video games are not for kids anymore. I'm assuming everybody knows that by now, but just in case you don't. Know. Anyway, so video games, right? So what you can do is you can build little games within the video game itself. And who does this successfully? Um, I don't know if you've played an RPG called Destiny, but if you have... And there have been a couple of occasions that uh, the company uh, that created the game, it's called Bungie, is one of the uh, large uh, video game creation studios. And uh, it created some sort of quest within the game where players to access certain loot, uh, a particular gun, they needed to solve a giant puzzle. Okay. And the puzzle was so intricate and complex that one individual will have taken literally years to solve it, right? So what they did is they built a story around it, and then they have the community basically solve the puzzle. Okay, and by community, I mean people going to Reddit and posting threads about, hey, this is what I'm doing, can somebody help me so that we can maybe find the right combination of whatever it is that you need to do to uh, find the solution to this giant puzzle, right? So now suddenly the message and the story that you're telling becomes what people become involved with, not necessarily the product itself. So it's not about playing the game, it's about solving the puzzle within the game, right? And that can make people really involved, like, you know, almost to the point of becoming obsessed with it, okay? And 
you can see this also with Pokemon Go. I, I have a short video here that I'm not going to show you now, but if you're interested, let me know. I'll be happy to post. But if you go to Google, uh, it's going to say Google. If you go to YouTube and you uh, type in uh, Old Man uh, and Pokemon uh, Go, you will see this gentleman in Taiwan who goes through Taiwan in a little bicycle with 15 or 20 phones, iPhones, um, displayed where he's looking for Pokemons all over the place, right? So he's so involved into the alternate reality that is created by this Pokemon Go that, you know, he just goes around the city and he's built this whole uh, rig so that he can literally look at uh, 20 or 20 plus, I don't know, count them. Uh, phones and and find these Pokemon monsters or whatever they are called. Right? So this is the idea of narrative transportation, right? Where you become so involved into the story that you almost you get immersed into the reality that is described by the company, right? And it's when you become part of the story, right? And that's that's the ultimate way of marketing something, right? If people are so involved and so interested that they become part of the story themselves, okay? Remember, stories are very powerful. If you learn how to tell good stories, you will do a great job uh, marketing and communicating with your customers. So what have we discussed in this chapter? Uh, first, we started talking about needs versus wants. We said that needs are inherent, uh, they're inherent to people and what we're going to do is we're going to fulfill these needs by using products and services. Now, uh, why different customers buy different products and services is going to be a function of their motivation, right? This motivation, uh, it's essentially answering the why question, right? And there are two distinct theories that tell you about motivation. What is drive theory that tells you that there is an imbalance um, within the individual, and because of that, uh, the individual is gonna seek products and services that help them come back to this balanced state. This is what happens, for example, when you're hungry. And then there is expectancy theory that essentially tells you that just because you're trying to achieve a certain goal and you think that something is gonna help you with it, you're gonna pursue it, okay? And this is gonna help you understand things like people going on a diet. Even if they feel hungry, so they are in this imbalanced state. They are actually not going to eat at that particular time because they are more interested in the long-term goal of losing weight. Okay, So expectancy theory will help you explain that. Okay, And then we also have talked about affect. Why have we talked about affect? Because we are creatures that can quickly make decisions about what we like and we don't like. And a lot of these emotions that we feel, like we see something and we are attracted to it, or maybe uh, we feel disgusted by it. It's something that happens almost instantly. So oftentimes we will provide motivations or reasons why we do things when we really don't understand even why we did it. We're just reacting almost instantly to the product or service. We do this with people as well, by the way. Okay. So because of that, we want to understand affect, right? And we've talked about both positive and negative affect. Right? And also we've talked about involvement. And the reason why we talked about involvement because it seems to determine which one of these processes uh, are going to take over uh, in the decision-making process that consumers go through when buying and selling products.